One more time, one more time. Hang on, honey. Do me like Jesus, let me know why. Do me like the Lord, do me like the Lord, take your mind. Do me like Jesus, be my friend. Be my friend. One more time. Hang on, honey. Do me like Jesus, oh, let me know why. Do me like the Lord, do me like the Lord, take your mind. Do me like Jesus, be my friend. Well, we want to welcome all of you to this very, very important moment. We're encouraging all of you as you are joining us with this stream that you would please share. Make sure you are sharing. We have Pastor Anselm Paul, who is here with us, hey, and we're hey. grateful that you are here. What's going on, Pastor Paul? Hey, man. How you doing, Doc? Doing all right? Listen, I'm doing great, man. I'm excited that all of us are here to get some good information in this voting season. Listen, this is crunch time, and we are excited wow. 
again that all of you who are tuning in are here. Pastor Paul, go ahead and tell the people that they got to share. They have to share. Hey, listen, listen, this this conversation today, I know if many of you have been like me in times past, I remember that we talked about this earlier, JD. First time I ever went into a voting booth, I went in there and I picked up the ballot and I was going there to vote for a presidential candidate. And that was it. And when I picked up the ballot, it was like this long, had all these names on it I'd never heard of. It had all kind of other uh, uh, issues that we were voting and I did not even know was there. So I didn't know. I knew two people on that entire ballot. And so it just blew my mind how much was actually at stake because I thought it was just the, the federal government and the, the, that, that stuff that was going on. And so we wanted to make sure that you guys, when you go, some of you have already voted and, and, and yeah. we're happy for you. Some of you have already done that and yeah. got it in early. But there are some of you that still have that ballot sitting on the table in that envelope. You haven't opened it yet. Some of you are planning to go stand in line. Some of yes. you haven't made up your mind yet. And so yes. we're hoping that 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 what we do today is going to encourage you to do that. But you know somebody who's at home who's in the same position you are and they need to be in this stream today. So yes. we want you to hit that share button, tag somebody, type some, call them out, call that brother's yes. name, that sister's name, type them up and say, look, you need to be here to find out what we're doing today on this statewide ballot in, in Florida. Absolutely. Well, listen, we actually have Pastor Batten, Pastor Fred Batten Jr., who's here as well. We want to bring him into the stream. Come on, Pastor. How are you hey, doing, Chief? Hey, man, I'm doing well. Doing well. Good to be with you guys, man, once again uh, on this uh, voter education uh, live at five. I was a little late, uh, but I'm here now. Oh, we're, we're glad, glad that you here. made it. Glad you made it. Hey, JD, let's tell them. So, so this is how do we come about doing this this uh, this feed today? How, this this stream today? Where, where, where did it originate? Um, who's a part of this? What's going on? So listen, we have some pastors in the Broward County. This is a very, very important county, y'all. This is one of the largest yeah. county with over 1 million registered voters. So wow. we're excited because we had pastors from the Broward County who came together and said, guys, we got to do something. We have to do something. What is it that we can do to be a blessing to the people? And we came up with this idea that, listen, while we have gone past phase one, phase one was about getting everyone to register and vote. Mm -hmm. Now we are right. shifting into phase two. Phase two now is about trying to educate everyone as we are preparing to go out there and exercise our right to vote. So again, these pastors came together in the Broward County area and we said, look, let's go ahead and do this. And look at this. This is where this is where we are. We're finally here finally on here. the day live at five. And we're <laughs> excited about our panelists. Now, do we have some important individuals who are going to bless the people today? That's my question. Who else is here to, to share? Yes, we've got some awesome folk who are joining us today. We've got uh, Leo Smart is yes, joining sir. us. I like the name just right out of the uh, gate. Leo <laughs> Smart. I mean, that, it just it just set him up, I hope. And we're just happy to have Leo with us. He is an educator. Um, mm -hmm. here in the South Florida area. And so, Leo, we are excited to have you with us, good sir. Um, we know that uh, you're bringing a lot of uh, some of the education type questions, things that might lend to, to your demographic or the people that you rub shoulders with. So we're excited to have you. We have Who else with do we the, have? Esquire Deanna M. Brown oh, uh, yes. is joining us. As she is, as you see on her tag there, um, Child and Family Law. She is joining us. We are so happy to have Deanna with us. And we're going to give them just a second when we finish this, J.D., uh, to give their own little shout out. Um, yeah. But then we have with us as well, we have Sandra Dennis. Yeah. Sandra Dennis. Um, and I definitely got to give her 30 seconds to, to tell us what Ava Ants and Sanma wow. means. All right. Wow. So we're going to, and we've got, I, I see that we have somebody else in the wings here. Yes. Um, and I'm not sure if it's time yet, if we get that tech piece worked out. But while we're waiting on that, I want to start with Sandra and just give us, uh, Sandra, you got 35.9 seconds to just give us a little shout out who you are, what you're into, uh, anything you want to say to our audience right now. Go. You got it. Sure. Sandra Dennis, born and raised in Broward County, grew up at Sinai Seven Day Advantage French Church, um, Haitian Church in Plantation, Florida. Currently have been attending Mount Pisgah. Um, my background is public health policy and management. 
I've been doing nonprofit work for the last 10 years. Currently, I'm the interim executive director at Miami Worker Center, and I'm the president and founder of Avancé Ensemble. Haitian Creole is no syllables left behind. You pronounce every syllable. I love it. So that's just a big education thing. Um, but I'm super excited to be here. I used to serve on the South Florida Youth, um, the South Florida Fe Federation, and happy to, to share any knowledge. I'm excited about elections because our vote is our voice and our power. I'm happy to among to be among families today. Awesome. Awesome. So good to hear that from you. Deanna, you've got 36.10 seconds. Come on. Go. <laughs> and I bet she's giving us some good Let's information right now. Is she, froze, <laughs> yeah, she froze up. She froze up uh, on her. On her OK, let's go to Leo. Leo, we're going to give yes. you the, 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 the gentle lady's time uh, as, as passed over to you, sir. Perfect. Uh, I'll be short. So Leo Smart, I'm an educator here in Broward, uh, Broward County School Boards. Um, I'm here not in an education capacity or as an educator, but to learn. Um, I am with uh, Adventist for Social Justice. I consider myself not only a seven day Adventist, but a seven day activist. All right. Good. All right. All right. Okay. Hey, so listen, I, I Sandra brought up a, a great point. We want to make sure that everybody knows that that this event today is is being sponsored by you. Know, so the pastors, the Adventist pastors in Broward County, um, represent over fifty six Adventist churches, twelve thousand seven hundred members, uh, four elementary schools, four middle schools. We've got two uh, early learning uh, child care centers in the Broward, and that's just in Broward County. Right. Um, and so uh, that's the demographic that we're representing but the event is being sponsored by the south florida adventist youth federation that yes. covers the period really of, of palm beach county broward county miami dade county um what's the one below miami dade uh, monroe is that monroe all the way right. down to monroe um and and then we've got uh just the the uh the quarantine revival um you see that icon in that uh there, Somewhere. there's the icon for the quarantine revival oh, over oh. there. Uh, yeah, that's you, JD. Um, <laughs> quarantine revival helping to sponsor this and put this out on their platforms. We're grateful to that, as well as the pastors' roundtable. Hey. Um, they have uh, been willing to help us to sponsor this event as well. So we want to thank all of those sponsors um, to that end. Now yes. we also are you in contact with with uh, I see Senator Thurston in the mm -hmm. in the window below but it doesn't, it doesn't look like our, our his camera and mic and stuff is up yet yep yep well he while senator senator thurston is connecting his mic and connecting his camera okay. i think we want to go ahead and bring back in esquire we got to bring in oh, she's Deanna. Back, yes. yeah she's back behind come on she's behind stage but we want right. to see her so let's yeah. bring her in are you with us Deanna? hello the camera keeps freezing. Am I frozen again? <laughs> you are good. We can hear you. Got it. Okay, Deanna, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give okay, you back you that thirty. Yes, can hear you. Okay. Are good. you hearing us? Okay. Hello, attorney Deanna Brown, West Palm Beach, Florida. I'm practicing. Been here 2011. Been here since then, but I've been practicing since '02 in Orlando, Florida. Primarily, my practice is fathers' rights. Um, where I, I really defend child, children's rights, but I do it through father's rights. So the right to the family, right for the children to be with both parents. Um, I generally, I'm always sitting on panels, assisting and educating individuals in the community on their rights, what they need to be doing, what they should be doing, the questions they should be asking in order to ensure that their rights are both protected as well as that the individuals that they elect are definitely engaging them and represent She was on a roll too. My oh, goodness, yeah. Yeah. She, she was she was going. She was going. Yeah. yeah. So Deanna's about to get her her setup back in, and once that comes back together, we're going to pull her in, and we of course want to hear from her because again, she has a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience, and again, we're glad that you all are here. Before we dive now, because I believe we're about to share some important information that maybe some of you have been waiting to see, waiting to yes, hear. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. This is now going to be a section where we're going to go through these amendments that you will actually see on your physical ballot. 
We're talking now about some specific, some specifics that we think you all will appreciate. And we're going to share our perspective on these things. And of course, we want before we do this now, Pastor Paul, Pastor Batten, uh, uh, Pastor Smart and Pastor Dennis. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> you're, you're you're now pastors right now. We we just want everybody to make sure they share. We got to share. Make sure you share this, y'all. Because this information that we're going to share, I know, is going to be more than beneficiary just for you. It's going to be beneficial for all of those with whom you're in contact. So if y'all are ready, let's go ahead and dive right into our discussion. All right. All right. So um, just preempting that just a little bit, when you get your ballot, you are going to see um, things that may be specific to your county. Um, there are going to be things that in your county that only your county in the state is voting on. Um, although we are representing Broward County today, we're not dealing with any countywide initiatives. We are specifically dealing with the statewide initiatives. There are six of them that are going to be on your ballot if you are in the state of Florida. Yes. So we're, yep. Um, so we're going to jump right in there. Um, are we ready, J.D.? We are ready. I'm, I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm sorry. I'm All salivating. Right. I'm excited about this. So, yes, we this go. is the moment. This is the time. Amendment number one to the to the state. This is what everybody in the state of Florida is going to see on your ballot. Amendment number one. Um, amendment number one. Um, it currently reads like this. And this is about citizenship and voting. The Florida Constitution currently says Every citizen of the United States who is at least 18 years of age and who is a permanent resident of the state, if registered as provided by law, shall be an elector of the county where registered. That's how the amendment currently reads in the Florida Constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, the amendment is to vote what is what you see on the bullet underneath that, which says under the ballot measure to this this year's ballot measure, the Florida Constitution would say only a citizen of the United States who is at least 18 years of age and who is a permanent resident in the state, if registered as provided by law, shall be an elector of the county where registered. So you'll notice that the difference is simply between every citizen, which is current, how it reads currently, and the, what is uh, being proposed is only a citizen. So that means if, and we'll switch to this next screen here, um, uh, next screen. There we go. A yes. If you vote yes on that amendment, that that yes supports amending the Florida Constitution uh, to state that only a citizen of the U.S. who is 18 years of older uh, can vote in Florida. If you vote no on that amendment, then that opposes changing it to that language and would keep it saying every citizen as opposed to the only a citizen. So. That's what we have for Amendment 1. I'm curious, what is the panel's thoughts on that particular amendment? Anybody amendment have any one. thoughts that jump out at you? Every to just citizen. Uh, I, I want to know what our uh, distinguished panelists have to say about this because I, I'm new to Florida, so I'm, I want to find out what's going on here. I mean, I would, I can begin and say that um, it seems to me, and this is my humble opinion, it seems to me that we're going from a word that's every, that could be thought of more inclusive to, um, to just, only, um, only. I'm sorry, only. let me look at specifically Every what the word only, is. right. Yeah. To only, yes. Um, and I, um, there's a lot around making sure that we can do the research to see who are the pro who are um, really making, proposing these um, changes. And when you do the research on that, I don't want to get into it. Um, it seems to me that there's some restrictions that are being made. We already know that people who are non-citizens can't vote. So I'm not really clear on what this is actually supposed to be doing. Um, I get a little uncomfortable when we're not being inclusive, um, when it's already that you can't vote if you're not a citizen. That's my opinion. Okay. All right. So it Leo. sounds like you're moving from an inclusivity to more of an exclusive verbiage. Language, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Let, let me let me let me play the other side of the fence though here on this one. Go ahead. But isn't that what voting is supposed to be? Isn't it supposed to be reserved for a specific group of people? It already is. Like you can't not be a citizen and vote here. I know we hear a lot in the news, but I mean, I'm a citizen and I've gotten like, you know, not having my voter registration, which you don't have to have to vote. I've gotten pushback at, um, in um, precincts about that. And so if you get pushback and you're born here, imagine if you're wow. not, right? And so it's clear, no one's voting if they're not citizens already. You have to be a citizen to vote in America. Um, and so I don't know what this is all about and I don't trust that kind of language. Okay. And I believe right. it's a violation if, if you're not a citizen and you attempt to go and vote. I'm, I didn't, I missed the question, Leo. No, it's not a question. I said it's, it's against the law. You, you can't be a, a non-citizen and try and vote. So, you know, words have meaning, you know, so I'm still trying to understand the difference only and every so i'm just waiting okay so are, we, are we thinking or, uh, or let me say it i'm thinking based on our conversation that this perhaps may be some a, is it possible it may be a sense of or a, an attempt at voter suppression suppression or repression i i florida my hometown my home state i love florida I think I'm going to live here for all of my life. Florida has a history of voter suppression. We see that with Amendment 4 that happened in 2018. Um, we gave all these returning citizens rights. The legislature has done so much to take them, take them um, away, even though we voted for it. And so we're um, repressing folks and suppression around voting isn't, isn't new to Florida. This is something that we see continue to happen. There's also purges from our voting list. People, if you don't vote consecutively um, every every so often, you'll be removed from the list. Um, and I'll say one more, and I'm sorry for being long-winded. I, I have a friend in Maryland, and they can vote. They can register to vote on the same day of elections. That's unheard of in Florida, right? We can't even imagine a system where you can register to vote and vote on the same day. Wow, wow. Hey, there's a, there's a, a comment I see in the chat here from Jennifer Sharon says mm -hmm. Florida sends ballots out to residents that have uh, houses in Florida, but also live in another U.S. state. Um, does the language affect, I'm not sure, do, do you think any of the language in that amendment impacts that at all? I'm not sure that it does, but right. it's just I think a, she was just making a good yeah, point. Yeah, making a good point, right. Right. Huh. This is good. This is very good. I think we've started off on, on, you know, we're, we're, we're moving. And I see, I see inside the, the comment section, we have people, look, I want to encourage you guys, please, power to the people. I love it. I love it. If you guys want to engage with us in discussion, I want to point your attention to the comment section. Feel free, y'all. Um, we want to hear your questions, hear your comments. This is a conversation that is not exclusive of your, in, your involvement. We want you to be involved and engaged. So please comment, share, and we want you all to join the discussion. Again, thank you all so much for that. Um, anything else on Amendment 1? Pastor Paul. Yeah, L later, but the last comment uh, was about if someone lives in a state, but in the amendment, it, it further clarifies and says uh, if you are a permanent resident of the state. So living in another state, that would be excluded. No, uh, or in the county, they have to be reg or uh, if you are registered in the county. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Let's read that last thing. Uh, 18 mm -hmm. years of age who is a permanent resident. You're right. They have mm -hmm. to be considered a permanent resident. Now, permanent resident doesn't necessarily, I mean, there are qualifications or qualifiers for permanent resident, but permanent resident of the state, if registered as provided by law, shall be an elector of the county where they are registered. Mm -hmm. Hey, there's Ronald Brise. Let's, can we, can we send this link to Ron? Uh, and bring Ron in. Is That's that what possible? we need to do. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Let, let, uh, let me. Um, what's Ronald talking Ron, about here? I, 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 he, I hope he's camera ready. Ron, <laughs> I'm going to send you this link, bro. Um, Ron, some of you who are watching, Ron used to be is a, a former representative, um, state representative 
um, schoolmate, classmate from from OU. I'm sorry, OC. I just told his age. Uh, uh, all right, go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back here, and um, well, I, I like his I like comment it. here. He says this is a turnout amendment and open the and opens the door for the legislature to create new laws to implement the amendment. That will likely lead to voter suppression, which was what was mentioned. Uh huh, Sandra. Uh huh. Yeah, she mentioned it, y'all. She I called mean, it out. I didn't mean to open that door. I didn't mean to open that door. <laughs> voter suppression. Um, so again, uh, that was that was uh, Mr. Brze who just shared, and hopefully will be joining us in a second. Um, but uh, that's yeah, that's that's good. I love how we're pointing out these these minute details. This is, I think, the type of critical thinking that's required to vote with intelligently, to vote with intentionality. Um, so, again, we appreciate that this conversation. Um, anybody else have anything they want to say about Amendment one before we move forward? All right. OK, we're ready to go to the next one. We're ready to go to Amendment two. Amendment number two. This one is going to be interesting as well. Here we go. Amendment number two. Uh, Fred, Amendment why don't you uh, read us through that one while I uh, search out Ron's stuff here? Sure. A yes vote supports the initiative to increase the state's minimum wage incrementally until reaching $15 per hour in September 2026. Mm hmm. A uh, no vote uh, opposes the initiative to increase the state's minimum wage incrementally until reaching a $15 in September 2026, thereby keeping the existing minimum wage of $8.56 per hour as of 2020 and adjusted annually. There you go. Very good. Yes or no, what are we thinking about the minimum wage? Well, I believe we actually have another schematic here um, that Pastor Paul put together and that can kind of show us. And we're going to go ahead and highlight that for you. It shows us here's what it would look like. The minimum wage increasing incrementally ten dollars on September 30, 2021, eleven dollars on September 30, 2022, twelve dollars. Um, September 30, 2023, $13, September 30, 2024, $14 on September 30, 2025, and $15 on September 30, 2026. So again, this is Amendment 2 that references the minimum wage. All right. So let's see. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to highlight or suggest as it relates to this particular amendment? Hey, look who's in the green room. I'm Do we have? <laughs> oh um, yes, Deanna too. <laughs> Deanna's Deanna's Deanna. in the she's in the stream. We're glad yeah, you're ho here. Deanna. Hold on, Deanna. We, well, no, Deanna. We want to we want to celebrate the fact that you're here, right? Quick, let's do that. We're glad that you made it back. <laughs> she made it back. Yes, indeed. Uh, but I am looking in the green room, Pastor JD, and I see all Who the way think? from the hot seat in Tallahassee, mm -hmm. Senator Perry. Thurston is, is with him? us. He's well, in I, there. I, I, I want to thank you all for having me. I was trying to get in on my phone and I couldn't do it, but I made it home. And so I'm on the computer, but I was listening to what you all said. And uh, so I heard you and I want to thank all the pastors for putting this on. And I'm, I'm pleased just to be here with your distinguished guests. Uh, but since you're on Amendment 2, I think that the thing that we should know, and from my perspective, we've been across the nation pushing for a $15, what we call a livable wage. And this uh, scheme that you put up there to show gradually how we get there is an example to show that uh, this amendment is trying to get us there without causing unnecessarily harm, without having the business community scream and saying they're, they're hair is on fire, but at the same time, it's moving towards that $15 amount that will help everyone to have a livable wage. So I, I think that that's the best thing about the amendment and clearly across the nation, everyone's trying to get to that point. So people don't have to work three full-time jobs just to pay their rent and 
be able to afford their medication. All right. I, listen, I, I I think that anybody who has ever flipped burgers at Burger King or, or uh, McDonald's or whatever is, is loving the idea of being able and who has also been doing that or, or anything else and trying to pay a car note, pay a, a, a rent or a mortgage uh, insurance. Yeah, that's going to make a whole lot of sense to them with that. However, let, what about the business, the small business owner who's just getting out of the gate. Um, Deanna is opening her, her, her practice and, and she can't do all the work herself. She needs to hire somebody just to answer the phones. And she's right. like, man, not only do I have to um, cover if they're full time, do I have to cover some benefits and things for them? Now I've got to come up with funds to be able to give them $15 an hour by the time we get to 2026. Is is that something that that small business owners are going to shy away from or that's going to hurt them? How do we speak to this to to any of our small business owners who may be a little uh, uh, squeamish about about how this is going to impact their business? I would I would add to this shockingly um, small businesses. I'm very familiar with worker cooperatives um, and small businesses in the communities that we we live in. Um, small businesses, actually, if they can go up on um, wages for their folks. We know we're hiring our own people. We're using them as their vendors and given the ability to do so, they always go up on their wages. We also know that when we're thinking about the drivers of poverty in our communities, it's big business. It's the hotel industry, hospitality industry. It's McDonald's who employs the most people in the States. They're the drivers of poverty in our community. Wow. These are the folks who are um, paying their folks 856. When we know currently, they say in Miami-Dade County specifically, you need $70,000 annually to be able to live comfortably. $15 an hour is not gonna get you there, but it's a start. I have a friend of mine, Linda, I was with her earlier and she said, a member of her, she's with 1199 SEIU. This wouldn't just change my life, $15, it would save my life. Wow. There are people who can't make it. Our moms, our aunts, our sisters who are doing backbreaking work. They're not in AC, they're not in front of computers like us. You know, there are domestic workers who are working with people in the nursing home, going to home health care. I think they deserve more. And it's not just on emotions. I know these big businesses who are driving poverty in the communities, they got it. Amazon did it in one day. They put pressure on Amazon. The next day, Amazon, in 21 days, excuse me, went up to $15. So we're asking the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, all those big businesses to go that route. I know it's for everyone. We got to think about small businesses, but I know small businesses do right by their communities. You know, when I first moved to Broward County, um, and Fred, you probably uh, know a little bit about this as well. Um, my uh, community service department, we were we were feeding the homeless. I mean, it was a fe homeless feeding ministry. And, and I would look at the numbers the, of, of people when they give the reports of how many people that we fed, how many people that we served. And as I began talking to them, like of thousands of people that, that they may have served and, and all over Broward County, I know the Adventist churches that we have are doing this. But when I talked to my, 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 my ministry leader who was doing that, she's telling me that the majority of the people that we are serving are not homeless. You, you I, I want everybody gets that, that yeah. the people who are showing up because they need assistance and they need food are not people who are homeless. They are what we call the working poor. Um, yeah. And so those are it, it, it. I think it speaks to a lot to Sandra, what you were just um, 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 addressing there. Yeah, yeah, Pastor, I, I would agree with that from my service leader as well. And also myself being out on several times when we see when we do our, our food distribution, uh, seeing different uh, socioeconomical uh, status or at least the appearance of that of individuals coming through. Uh, needing uh, some assistance. So yes, I, I, I concur with that idea. And also just as a pastor um, moving uh, uh, to this area, um, knowing uh, from where I, uh, where I came from, I came from Tennessee coming to Florida to pastor and the cost of living was astronomically different. Uh, and so I do understand uh, it's, it is a very 
uh, it's a, it's a challenge uh, to be able uh, uh, to uh, to make it. And, and, you know, right now, my wife is not working. And so it is, uh, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. But you know, I, I do want to just play devil's advocate because I agree with the amendment. We do have a lot of individuals that are living, they don't have the livable wages. However, the $15 will respect the small businesses. And those small businesses, I know a lot of small businesses that would like to pay that amount. They are not always able to pay that amount. So now that will put out of business some small businesses. We will have them disproportionately affected, which will mean that more people will have to work to reach their success goals. And they will have to work for someone, which not always will make you as much money as you would have made in private, or not private practice, but in a, your own, own business. But now you don't have the amount, the money to hire someone and also the money to, you know, pay yourself properly. Additionally, it kind of, it means that not only is it going to have to go up just minimum wage, but if now we're paying, as he says, somebody who's working at McDonald's $15, what are you now going to expect that professionals are going to want to be paid? So it will trickle down all the way across. It won't just be the minimum wage workers making more. Professionals will now be charging more for their services. So overall, it's as if the cost of living is in going to go up. Just really quickly. Oh, what? Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Denise. Go no, ahead. Senator um, Thurston, so happy to be on here with you. I just really quickly, my stance is people over businesses all the time. I'm a Christian. Um, my stance will always be around. Um, I've seen um, people find money to do things that they want to do in terms of government, in terms of businesses. We're talking about businesses who are going to lose on their profit. They're not going to go under. But we're talking about people who have continued to go to work during this pandemic, who put their lives on the line, who's going into people's homes, who's serving us food. They don't deserve to have digni dignified jobs. You know, they don't deserve no, to I, make. I, I, and I'm not saying that's what you're saying. I'm just saying in general, like to me, the question is posed. People who are doing work that allows us to be who we are. Do they deserve to have a wage that makes sense? And I'm remember, seventy thousand dollars is what it takes. We're just saying fifteen dollars an hour. And Senator Thurston can tell you how much people have advocated, gone to Tallahassee, trying to push a legislator to do something to enact legislation to allow for this to happen in a way that it makes sense for business as well. And they've refused. So now we got it on the ballot. And, and Ms. I'm Brown. And Ms. Brown, I think your point is well taken, but that's why I emphasize the fact that the way this amendment does it is it's gradually. But uh, to your point, uh, I think it was Pastor Paul who talked about flipping burgers. A lot of times when you go in these establishments, these are not little kids who are flipping burgers. Mm -hmm. These are people who have families, yeah. people who are trying to take care of their families. And, and quite frankly, the motivation across the nation for this $15 an hour is because you were thinking that uh, to your point about who's in these food lines. These are people who are working 40 hours a day. Mm -hmm. These are not people who are looking for a handout. They have two and three full-time jobs, but in order to make ends meet because we're not paying a livable wage, they have to do that. And, and then still receive uh, some type of uh, assistance from the government. So this won't get us there, but it will certainly help us once we get to that $15 an hour. And I, I think that certainly there is a, an argument from the business community, but when you talk about people like uh, McDonald's or Burger King or some of these establishments, we're really talking about their profits. We're not talking about them going under. We're talking about their profits. And if you look at their profitability, you see that they have the ability to do it. And these people that we're talking about are the frontline workers. These are the essential workers. These are the people that work when lots of uh, 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 others were able to uh, work from home or to do other things or to adjust in some way. And, and we're just talking about paying people an amount that they can live on, a livable wage. That's what and I know. just want to be clear, though, but 
I understand what you're saying and who's being targeted, but the amendment does not reflect that. The amendment does not specify how much your profit has to be before you have to then pay this amount. And I just, and I, like I said, I believe that it should, everybody needs a livable wage, but I'm just saying these are some considerations too. Yeah, it is. It is nice to have. Th so thank you, all, everybody, so much for your 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 input there. I just want to I just want to recognize the fact that we have Ronald Brise in the chat with us today. Um, good to have Ron with us. Um, Ron actually kind of helped us formulate this concept even today. Um, but Ronald, let me ask you this. So so this is so in, on this particular issue, and we got to move to the next one soon here. Um, on on this issue, and I think to maybe Deanna's point. In doing this, wouldn't this, wouldn't this ultimately down the road make the fifteen dollars an hour the new eight twenty five? Down the road, and uh, considering what will happen with inflation and all of those factors, uh, that over time could make the the fifteen dollars equivalent to to what currently is eight twenty five. Uh, but but the idea behind the the amendment is really to maintain a, a wage that is livable, right? And, and, and that is the, the principle and the concept behind it. And so there are things that, that uh, government and community can do to ensure that there is um, ample activity within the business community to support the efforts of ensuring that small businesses have the opportunities necessary in order to support um, those wages at that rate. Um, when you think about, and, and I know that uh, the conversation has centered around small businesses, but when you think about the, the large employers within the state, um, so I live in Orange County, and so you think about the Disney's of the world, you think about the Universal's of the world, and all of those entities that support the tour tourism industry, which is the fundamental industry here in the state of Florida, that and, and, and agriculture. And so when you have those two sets of, of, of workers that make up the vast majority of workers here in the state of Florida, you lift those boats, then that changes the dynamic across the economy and therefore makes it, a, makes it um, more feasible for the, the ripple effect of that to allow um, the economy to support um, small businesses as they work towards um, um, uh, implementing the, the amendment. Okay. All right, uh, Pastor Batten, let's, uh, let's, let's everybody, let's move to amendment three here. Amendment three, um, Pastor Batten, take us through this one. Sure. Amendment three. A yes vote supports establishing a top two open primary system for primary elections for the for state legislators, the governor, the cabinet, uh, the attorney general, uh, chief uh, financial officer, and uh, commissioner of agriculture in Florida. That's for number three. That's a yes vote. That means you support that idea. A no vote opposes establishing a top two open primary system for primary elections, thereby leaving in place Florida's current system where closed primaries are held by each party. So what say ye panel on amendment three? The issue for me, oh, somebody is talking. No, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say the issue for me with three is that what it's going to do is water down the minority voice and it's going to allow individuals who have no interest to do basically vindictive voting so that they ensure that their true candidate is possibly the best candidate so that their candidate gets elected. And that's essentially so, I mean, I'm in opposition to that one. I could not agree with uh, Ms. Brown more. And I think that, you know, you're talking about a dilution of your minority representation. And I'll give you a clear example. In our last gubernatorial race, we could have very well had a Adam Putnam versus Ron DeSantis 
as opposed to a Gilliam versus DeSantis. Now, we didn't get the result that I wanted. However, I'm certainly glad that I had an opportunity to say, well, let's push for this candidate over this candidate as opposed to two candidates that we uh, pretty much don't like. Uh, certainly, if we had that, we would say, oh, we could live with this one more than this one. But quite frankly, this would dilute. Currently, we have uh, uh, 27 members of the Florida Legislative Black Caucus. I could see us being down to 12 or 13 overnight with this amendment. Okay, can we for a second, before we dive much deeper into this, for the brand new voter, um, brand, person who's brand new to this whole process, what does this mean? What, what is this saying? I mean, what's a primary, open primary, closed primary? What is that about? Anybody want to want to take us through that one? Sure, I can do that. Um, so if you are a brand new voter and you have selected a party as part of your registration and you could choose to select uh, to be a, a non-party or or um, independent, right? But if you've selected a party, then you are wearing essentially a, a, a jersey and you're part of a team. And so you're either part of the Republican team, the Democratic team, the Green Party, or, or whomever as part of a party. And so you wanna have the right to say who's going to represent your team in in the in the race right mm -hmm. and so that's what the the primary system allows to happen now i do recognize that those who are part of the independence or no party affiliation um they want to have a say in the primary part but you can select a party that you have the greatest <laughs> affinity to and then make us make a selection then and then ultimately in the general election you will choose out of the best two candidates that rise out of that process as senator thurston mentioned and deanna mentioned uh, uh, miss brown mentioned as well that all this would do if, if 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 this amendment is approved it will dilute um the minority's opportunity and really will become the race for the the, the biggest pockets and so therefore, even districts that are currently constructed in such a way that uh, provide a, uh, an opportunity for majority minority um, individuals to win um, that seat, that those dynamics will change. And, and from my perspective, um, that's not good for democracy. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to weigh in on this one before we, and if we have any questions from our audience, we are watching, we're monitoring that, uh, that feed as well. So if you guys have any questions on this one, now is the time. Pastor Paul. Uh, yes. Uh, so I want to make sure I'm a, he, I'm this new voter here. I, I, I want to make sure that in my, in my small mind, I won't be able to understand. So what we're saying is that, if we have uh, more voting in these primaries like this, it's like me taking my Kool-Aid uh, and I, uh, I am putting more water in it. So the flavor of my Kool-Aid is diluted. It is, it is, it is watered down. So, uh, that, so I'm not getting that flavor in, in, in the election process. That's, is that what I'm hearing? And I hope my analogy is not too uh, it's it not too sophomore. No, I think you have a very good analogy. And, you know, I think, you know, I missed part of the First Amendment, but I think that, you know, for the new voter, we have to really, and, and that's why it's so good you're doing this, to educate the new voters, but even the current voters. A lot of times the amendment may sound one way. Uh, for instance, they say, everybody votes. Well, that sounds really good until you get down into the details of what they're saying and who's who's who are they going after with this everybody votes. I've had a number of independents who've come to me before and say, well, Thurston, I could not vote for you in the primary, but I see I can vote for you in the general. Well, you know, I don't want to be blunt, but I basically told them, well, you got to pick a team. You pick a team. Pick a team, and then you can vote with that team. And even with that, towards the at the end, you can vote with everybody votes at that point. 
but don't come into as miss brown was saying don't come into my team and say well thurston is a strong democrat i want a democrat that may be a little weaker who won't fight for health care who won't fight for a fair minimum wage we can all put our power behind him and we're not thirsting out then it's thirsting against the republican or you know so you can come in and influence this team so uh, you know without being more blunt about it i look at this as to pick a team of them and okay. you have to at that point uh influence that team to move towards where you want to be because you know if the first time voter hears this and and some people out there are real good at this they're real good at saying oh there's nothing wrong with amendment one we just changing one word well that one word is designed to attract to deflect from all of the um, Caribbean voters that's come into my district, uh, the students that's come to these United States, to say to just kind of nudging them away from being able to vote, or this uh, everybody votes. It sounds really good, Pastor uh, Batten, but when you really get down to it, it's about diluting the influence of the minority community. And I tell you, your representation will be in half if this amendment passes. All right. All right, let's move. We got to move to amendment number three here. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. We're at amendment number four, if I am correct. Now let's yeah. move to number four, constitutional amendments. Pass to B. All right. A yes vote supports requiring voter approved constitutional amendments to be approved by voters at a second general election to become effective. That's a yes. That should be vote. Has a, uh, to go through it a second time. A no vote opposes requiring voter approved constitutional amendments to be approved by voters at a second general election to become effective. Okay, panel, help us out. Uh, well, yeah, I, help, I know us, that, help us, help us. <laughs> I, I know that on this uh, 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 platform and as people of the cloth, you all not telling people how to vote, but this is a uh, a God awful amendment. <laughs> he said, I'm not, I'm I, not I, one of y'all. Okay. I'm not one of y'all, so I can say that. But, but, but let me just to give you, I, I think it's always good to talk about examples. Think about amendment for restoration of rights. So the people came out overwhelmingly to vote, to give people a second chance once they've served their time. Now take away from the fact that the legislature has carved it up and tried to uh, do everything they could to kill it when they had every opportunity to do it themselves and put it on the ballot and they didn't. But this is saying that you would have to vote again a second time on that. And, and, and why would you do that? There's no reason to do that. There's no reason for this amendment similar to amendment number one. But, but the purpose behind the amendment, just so you'll know, people have what we call direct democracy. That's when you can decide, I'm going to uh, petition and put this amendment on the book so the people all across the state can, can, can vote on it. But why would they do that? They would do that because the legislature has not been active in, in pushing forward the, the, the laws that the people are asking for. The people were asking for restoration of rights. I happen to have served with uh, uh, Ron Brise in the Florida House. And we were pushing all the time for restoration of rights. So they never did it. So the citizens did it. So what this, and, and then the, the legislature or the leaders, they're so upset about people putting forth laws that they really want and that the people want. And, and, and how do I know the people want them? Because they vote for them overwhelmingly. Class size amendment. The people wanted smaller classes but the legislature wouldn't do it. So the, the citizens put that together. Uh, medical marijuana, the citizens put that together. Environmental justice, the citizens put that together. And, 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 and restoration of rights, that came from the citizens. 
So what the legislature is doing here is trying to make it more difficult, difficult for citizens to put on the ballot that which citizens want. But this isn't the only thing. This is just the uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg. What they've also already done is make the criteria higher. It used to be 50 percent plus one. No, now it goes up to 55 to 60 to 70. They're going to make the, the threshold so high, it's hard for the voters, even once it's on the ballot, to get it done. What else have they done? They make it more difficult for you to get the number of petitions to even get it on the ballot. So they're attacking your ability for direct democracy every way they can. This okay. is another attack on your ability for direct democracy, and it's totally unnecessary. I don't know if you have got it or not, but I know on this. <laughs> so I would chime in on this one too, and and basically say I am no on this one, and and for some very practical reasons, the citizens go out and get seven hundred thousand plus signatures, right? They get over the hurdle of getting the language approved by the Supreme Court. They get sixty percent of the people to vote to agree to the language. And then we're now saying that they have to be second guessed and wait for another election to have that approved. So what does that do? It allows all of the interests, generally whatever interest they may be, to now gear up again to fight against this amendment, whatever amendment it was that the people put together to pass. So this is an anti-democratic amendment. Mm. And, and so that's my take on, on this particular amendment. Okay. Sandra, you were going to, yeah. Chime I'm in. just going to add it because I have to run. I have another live. I think what we're seeing um, is there continues to be uh, the fight to suppress us and our ability to have democracy work for us, um, specifically in such a swing state as Florida. I think many of the amendments that we're talking about, Amendment 2, um, this one as well, we know for a long time there's been things that we need to get done in this sunshine state that hasn't been able to get done. Um, and petitions, love them. Um, we should be able to say, look, we sent you all to Tallahassee, y'all can't get it done for many reasons. Let's try to get it done on the ballot. Around Amendment 2, I think the same thing. I've gone to Tallahassee with many organizations from South Florida pushing for there to be some kind of um, legislation on minimum wage. It hasn't been happened. Legislation that would have included small businesses, legislation that would have been done well because we trust the folks that we vote for. It hasn't been able to happen. And we think that it's okay for it to go to a petition. Um, my, I'm, I'm from a Haitian family. Um, anything that infringes on our rights make me real nervous. We don't like that kind of stuff. We know dictatorship. We know what that looks like. And so I'm asking folks to, you know, even God gives us free choice, right? <laughs> and so I want to leave us with that. And I hope our community and our and our Adventist community sees what how much is on the line um, in this election and all elections. And I hope prayerfully that we do our part as well. Thanks so much for having me. And I just have to run. Awesome. Thank you, Sandra, so <laughs> very much for joining us today. We wish you well on your next uh, next assignment there. One last question on this one. Um, Aran, I'll, I'll address it to you, but anybody who wants it can 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 take a shot at it. Um, Usually when somebody, uh, uh, if we're explaining what we think somebody means when they give us something, that's one thing. But I'm curious as to what the proponents of this one, what are they saying that it means? What's their argument? What is the argument that they are making that makes this make sense? There's somebody out there that this amendment makes sense to. What is it that it, even if it is kind of a under the cover, their real issue? What are they saying that the issue is? Yeah, so they're saying that, um, that we shouldn't legislate via the, the Constitution. And that's part of the argument that's out there with respect to cluttering the Constitution with what should be in statute. So that's one of the arguments that's out there for, for the uh, opponents of this. Um, the other thing is creating a cool off period um, for those, for the language for people to understand it fully, get a sense of what it is, and for people to come back and have time to evaluate it and then support it again. And if it meets that threshold again, then it would um, it would come in, into effect. So that's what the uh, 
proponents, proponents would. Okay. of the of the um, language are saying. And Pastor, the other thing that they're saying is that they're saying, "Oh, it's our constitution. Right. It's it's a you. If you're going to change our constitution, then you should be able to not rush into this." And that's the cool off period that uh, 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 Representative Rizé is talking about. Well, you can't just change the constitution. You have to have this cool off period. Well, as the uh, young lady who just got out has said, she has come up to Tallahassee over and over and over trying to get some of these things that we're dealing with on these amendments done to no avail. So it, had that happened, they could have had all the debate and all the discussions about all the issues that they want. They just don't want to do this. And wow. therefore, the citizens, this is direct democracy where the citizens are saying, this is what we want and give us what we want. And I think it's a beautiful thing. But I don't think that you should keep putting in hurdles because uh, Representative Brise talked about the 60% threshold. Well, it hasn't always been 60%. Hmm. It was made 60% to make it more difficult. It mm. hasn't always, it hasn't all, not if getting petitions, the time frame to get those thousands and thousands of petitions has been shortened. They, oh, you can't pay people to get those petitions. You can't do this. So there are a number of things that are being done every session to cut back on the ability of citizens to do what this does. And this second vote after it's already been decided is just another hurdle put in the way of direct democracy. And right. also, I want to caution because I, what I think, too, is going to be stated is that with some voters, they're going to say, well, if something you wanted to pass didn't pass because not enough people knew about it, we give them a second time and it can possibly get passed the second time. And I want that to, you know, definitely because what will happen is it will actually negatively affect the people who think that, oh, the second go round is going to help benefit me because it's really going to affect you negatively in a lot more decisions that will be made about who you are and what happens with you. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, Doc Batten, amendment number five. Amendment number five. We've got, we've got one more amendment, uh, ladies and gentlemen. There are six altogether, at least six statewide amendments. Again, you may have more in your, in your local counties, but as far as the statewide, this is number five of six. All right. A yes vote supports extending the period during which a person may transfer Save Our Homes benefits to a new homestead property from two years to three years. A no vote opposes extending the period during which a person may transfer Save Our Homes home benefits to a new homestead property from two years to three years. So there you have it, amendment number five. So what are we saying to that? I actually have questions on this one because this one was a little confusing for me. And what I wanted to know was what this one was, is there case law that has gone into this? I mean, like, why is this coming up? Has there been issues where people have been negatively affected? Oh because of the the lack of time the two years was not enough why is this coming up and um, being supposed to be actually added into the constitution as opposed to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis okay deanna I, just before we get to that answer to that question again i'm looking out for my for my brand new voters my voters who have no clue what we're even talking about here <laughs> um <laughs> is, is there is there somebody who can tell us and i'm going to put it right back up there um, can tell us what, what is what even is this thing this save our homes uh, save our homes benefits who does this impact what what is it and who does it impact what is the issue about save our homes benefits well well I think that it is good to know what save our homes is and what portability is because you need to know that in order to get an idea of what this amendment does so there was a time when the prices of real estate was increasing so quickly that if you owned a home and you sold that home and you went to buy another home, well, the tax rate that you are buying this next home is, is so high, you can't afford to buy that home. 
So by being a homeowner, Save Our Homes, there was a, it was what's called a Save Our Homes Amendment. And it said that if you take the funds from that sale of the home and put it into the purchase of your next home, then you can stay at the same tax rate and you're not priced out of the market. You actually can still afford to buy another home. So the law became that you had two years to do that or else you lose that the portability is being able to transport that savings to your next home. And you could do it for up to two years. Well, there are people who got caught and they couldn't transfer it. So now they don't have that savings anymore. They may have lived in that home for 20 years, but now mm -hmm. on this next home that they get ready to purchase, they're going to be paying an escalated rate because the price of real estate has changed from the time that they lived in that home mm -hmm. to what the neighborhood is going for now. So that was the concept of the Save Our Homes Amendment. What this is saying is that in the market, sometimes a person can't get that uh, new home within that time frame. So it's asking to give them an additional year when they get ready to purchase a home based on the, the funds that they got from the sale of that first home. And, and, and look, uh, we always want to help citizens in buying homes. But you would get some people in in Broward County, for instance, we have 36 municipalities and some of those municipalities are not on the beach. Some of those municipalities are not just major big homes where they're getting a lot of tax revenue to provide the police service and provide for all the services in the community. Now, those small town mayors may say, well, this is just taking revenue out of our coffers. And any homestead exemption is uh, uh, exempting the value of the home, therefore exempting the tax revenue that those residents are paying to their uh, local municipal government. So you'll probably get more pushback from some of those municipalities about how this is going to affect them than anybody. But the affordability of the home, being able to transfer that to a, another uh a facility that's what this is all about okay yeah so, so on this one i would say it's just as as the, the senator just mentioned just think about it uh with respect to your municipality right um they have a set budget and if you're adding one more year of portability then how does that impact your budget for um your local government that means your your city your county and your school, uh, the public school system. So those are the things that you got to balance out in thinking about this. Okay. Um, and Deanna, did, did your question get get answered in in those responses, or, or do we need, we can we come back to come back to your question now? Okay. So that does because it then it broke down exactly what it is. So it tells you like how it's going to affect the individual. So it it made more sense now than before with me not understanding what the Save Our Homes was about. Okay. All right. I'm going to throw it back up on my screen one, screen one more time so that our audience can make sure that they read it again. If we have any other questions from our, 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 our panelists or even from those in our live streams, and I know we have streamed this to many different sites. I'm not sure that we are seeing everybody's comments from all of the or questions from all of them. So our apologies to that, but we are going to try to make sure that we get any questions that we do come across you know, i do have one other question is there any other way to handle this outside of the constitution like is this something that local government can good actually question. Deal with? good question so for those who have who put what what was it amendment four on the constitution <laughs> right <laughs> who, who say uh, keep our constitution clean and all of that this is probably one of those things that should be a statutory thing um, my general philosophy is that taxation is not something that you, you should deal with in the Constitution um, for a few reasons, right? Um, simply because if your economic situation of the state changes or the dynamics of the, of the economy changes, you then don't have the flexibility to, to react. 
The legislature's hands are tied with respect to that. Your local municipality's hands are tied to, with respect to that. So then you have all issues. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna give a, a church example, right? You a church has a budget that's based upon its offerings, at least in the in the Seventh Day Adventist tradition. And your tithes you can't touch, right? So anytime you put something in the Constitution, you put it in the tithe um, component. And so therefore, you have no flexibility with, with your local budget to address it. But if you don't put it in the tithe component, then you have flexibility to play around with it, move it as you need to, based upon the, the, the daily demands or, or, or the momentary demands that face you. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right, Pastor Fred, are we ready? For the next one. Uh, let me read this cue card. Put it up. I'm ready for my <laughs> Okay. All right. Here we go. Last one, ladies and gentlemen. Amendment number six. Amendment number six. Homestead property tax discounts for spouses of deceased vets. A yes vote supports allowing a homestead property tax discount to be transferred uh, to the surviving spouse of a deceased veteran a no vote opposed allowing a homestead property tax discount to be transferred to the surviving spouse of a deceased veteran okay that's uh that's a question that's a, an amendment there and there's a whole lot of of emotions can be tied to that one so who wants to tackle that one first well, well, let me try it first. And the reason being is that it's very similar to the previous amendment. And uh, my uncle Ken, who's the mayor of Lotta Hill, just walked in. But he would say that, uh, as Representative Brise said, this is taking funds out of the coffers of the municipal government. But at the same time, there are those who would say when a spouse goes to war, the whole family goes to war. So basically what this amendment does, it says if that spouse who's a military person dies, then so dies the, uh, the exemption. The exemption is gone because the person who actually served in the military is no longer there to take adv advantage of it. But to that widower or that spouse whose husband served in the war, she would be saying, or he would be saying, well, you know, when my husband served or my wife served, I serve too, so I should be able to keep this exemption, even though the mayor may be saying, well, that's taking revenue out because now one would say, well, you weren't getting at revenue anyway when the spouse was alive. However, this will deplete potential revenue for the municipality. Uh, but again, does both parties go to war when one goes to war? Anyone else want to? I, I don't think there's a whole lot more to add to that other than um, what's your philosophy on taxation things being on the on in the Constitution? Um, should this be a statutory um, uh, thing or should it be in the Constitution? And then what's your philosophy with, with respect to um, the impact of these types of amendments on local government funding? And so those are things that people should take into consideration when deciding on this particular amendment. So if I can maybe kind of translate that for me into, into to layman's terms or, or my terms. So we're saying that if this is a yes, if we go yes on this, then that's going to take away the money to upgrade my kids science labs in this in the in the classroom or that might take away from them being able to fix the pothole in on on my street um because we're continuing to fund after the end is, is that basically kind of what the somebody would say if they if they wanted to vote no on this that would be part of the rationale that would be part of the rationale that it would encumber some of the funds um, the municipality that the local municipality would have, and if someone wanted to vote yes, they could say that the 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 exemption is extended as a result of the service that the family has um, done for the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So this is really going to have a lot to do with how you feel about about military service and military families, etc. All right. Um, we've got a question from Maya Byfield, that, or, or let's go for it. Lady J first. She says, was that not always in place? Was that not always in place is the question. Well, well, there's always been in place an exemption for military service, but that exemption normally went away when the military party passed away. So this amendment is there to protect that person. So the addition here, if you vote yes, you're saying that uh, you want to protect that person. But if you vote no, you're saying, as Lady J say, you want it to stay the way that it is. And that uh, exemption dies with the military veteran. Okay. All right. Next question we have is coming from Maya Byfield, and it's asking, wasn't Homestead on the last ballot? Why does it seem like it's always on the ballot? Something about homestead exemption seems like it's always on our ballots. Was there something on the last ballot about homestead? If there was, how does it differ from, from what, uh, I guess we're looking at number five. That was a reference to number to, to amendment five. Well, she's probably right to a certain extent because two of these uh, amendments affect homestead and that's what uh, the mayors of the municipalities are probably saying. If the value of the homes in my community are only so high, you've got the natural homestead for it being your residence. The more you exempt for it, the less revenue I have to run my city. But then the question becomes, how is it being applied? Is it fair that the amendment that was put on for veterans does not inure to the benefit of the widow? So, yes, there is something on the ballot quite frequently about homestead. You know, that's the person's biggest investment is their home. Right. So that's why you can continue to get those type of amendments. Okay. All right. Um, Arsenda Massa Paul says, I like that name. That's a pretty name. I like it. Um, it says, so if you support your flag and the military, you would vote yes is the question. Um and and widowers you <laughs> and yes. widowers yeah okay but i just want to be clear too with that one once again it doesn't specify if you were married to somebody in the military for one day versus if you were married to them for mm. 20 years correct that's a very good point and and you're absolutely right it does not hurt that must be a lawyer talking over there <laughs> Getting that, was, that, was, that was the, the lawyer teasing out that point. I said, yeah. Yeah, it's getting into the nitty gritty of it all. Good stuff. Hey, well, listen, folks, that, that, Fred, that is the last of our amendments. Some of you are noticing that we lost our other co host here. Um, he texted me and said he was having a, a little trouble with his Wi Fi, but he has been behind the scenes uh, doing a lot of the technical stuff. He is still with us. And I'm going to see if, as we wrap up here, JD, can we give it another shot and see if you can get back on? Because in this last part of our discussion before we wrap this up, we just want to have a little quick discussion. We've, we've wrestled with, and, and there are many um, communities of faith that wrestle with the idea of getting involved in the political process on many different fronts, right? One of them is that there are some, I, I hate to say this with, with in front of Ron and, and Perry, uh, 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 but there are many folk who say we can't trust none of them. They, they, that's just that they're all. It's a politician, and politician is like a four-letter word. Um, and so, if I'm voting for them, for these individuals, then that that creates an issue that that may rub up against my faith. There are probably many people of faith right now who voted for uh, some of our current. Uh, uh, individual in office, y'all heard what I said, um, who, who, who may be feeling some kind of way as it pertains to uh, their moral compass. Um, so, so in, and, and then there are those who says, yeah, I will vote on issues like this, um, or maybe I shouldn't because I don't want to get into the fray. There are 
all even though it's an issue there may be some evil designs behind the scenes that i just don't know and i'll be lending my voice and lending my support that somewhere down the line because it was devised as we we talked about some of that no matter what the language says it may mean something else and so we have people who have some they're very cautious when it comes to voting how do we pastor fred um, or anybody else uh, on here, uh, how, how do we position, what do we say to the Christian community, to the people of faith that may have some of those type of reservations? Are they valid? Um, how should they address them? Can I speak correct? before we get deep into it? Go ahead. Yes. Um, well, for me personally, if I were speaking to that individual, I would say as far as voting and saying that you don't want to get involved in politics i think first of all if you're a faithful person you have faith not in the process but you have faith in god that he mm. will direct the process so your your votes should be based upon discernment if it is really troubling to you you take it to the lord in prayer and he will direct you as to what you need to do however we have to remember god got involved jesus got involved in politics there were, you know, when you see individuals who are being oppressed, when you see things going on that are negatively affecting a particular group, you as a Christian have a duty to get involved because we're all about equality. So for me, voting is not something that we should take lightly. And as Christians, we should be more so in the fight for equality for everyone to ensure that the democratic process is actually being used as it should be. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Pass to B. Yeah, I I, I concur. Uh, uh, she she has uh, uh, placed uh, that on uh, that uh, right there. I, but I would just simply add, uh, if we are understanding our uh, not only our Christian uh, 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 responsibilities, um, but our civic responsibilities. Uh, God, Christ tells us. Uh, the Scripture tells us that we are to occupy until he comes, we are occupying in this place uh, until uh, we move to a better place. Uh, but we want to be able to be informed of, uh, of what is going on in our society so that we can make intelligent uh, decisions uh, to the best of our ability. Now, so as you mentioned, someone said that uh, someone may uh, vote for, they are resident to vote because of some situation they did not agree with about a particular uh, policy or a or a platform of a particular party. Well, if we understand that that there is not, I'm not going to agree 100% with everything everyone says as from a politician standpoint, or even for that matter. And now that I'm older, I can say this from what my parents said. Mm, okay. So. Uh, I can now make some intelligent decisions based upon my experience and my exposure so that I can now make those, make those decisions. And I think uh, from a Christian standpoint, not just Christian standpoint, but from a citizenry standpoint, uh, that we ought to be able to make that, uh, that investment and vote. And, and may I dare say uh, uh, that uh, the the lives and the blood, sweat, and tears of our ancestors uh, needs the validation of our vote as well. All Pastor right. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Doc. Go ahead. Right, listen, I'm sorry, y'all. My video is not working, but as long as my voice can be heard, I got to hey, say hey. something. I got to say something because here it is. Faith without works is dead. Don't mm. complain to me about anything that has to do with any law or any judge or any politician when you've not engaged in the process and exercised your right to vote. Here it is. Mm. I think that when you pray about issues, God is answering the prayer often with opportunity for you to engage as a, a, a uh, problem solver. And with the opportunities he's given us, um, it is, I believe, absolutely Christian for you to go out there and exercise every possible um, avenue to help uh, move our community forward. 
and to make decisions, y'all, outside of the four walls of the church. We have no problem with politics inside the four walls. We'll vote for a leader in our board. We'll wow. vote for a leader wow. in our business meeting. But when yeah. it comes to voting and participating in the political uh, scene outside of the four walls of the church, all of a sudden, it's all about the devil. We can't trust nobody. <laughs> well, I suggest, well, yeah, y'all can't see me, so I might as well say it. Yeah, I, I'll suggest to you that some of those folk you're voting for in the four walls of the church might be uh -oh. less. Never mind. No, I'm not going to say that. Uh -oh. <laughs> we like to talk about politics. Somebody mute him real quick. <laughs> that, listen, all, I, all I'm going to say is um, it is absolutely Christian, um, and we have no right to pray about issues that God has given us the ability to influence. Um, and again, if you recluse yourself in the four walls of the church and pray about stuff, you're just as you you are just just like that 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 church that prayed for Peter when he was locked up mm. in jail. God released Peter from prison. God released him. He opened up the door of the jail. He opened up the door of the city and brought Peter right there to the front door of the house where they were praying. And then wow. when they heard the knocking on the door, the the people told that little girl Rhoda. They said, "Hold on, listen. That's not Peter. That's an angel." And they went back to praying about that issue. What I'm suggesting to you is there are certain doors that prayer won't open. God opened up every door in that story and brought the answer to the front door of the house. But then God said, I brought the answer to your front door. Now get off your knees and pray on your way to opening up that front door. So in, in essence, faith without works is dead. Get out there and vote. And don't you dare use Christianity as an excuse to sit mm -hmm. silently like a statue on the sidelines. Yes, sir. Wow. Pa hey, Pastor Baden, I, I wanted to sit back and see what the ministers had to say about that uh, issue that you threw out there. And I'm glad to hear uh, you all's various pos positions. So it would be far be it for me to start telling people, you know, when it comes to those type of issues. But I, I do want to say this to you. I know that uh, Ms. Brown is a lawyer, and quite frankly, I've been practicing law for 30 years. And uh, I uh, do a lot of criminal defense, and I have over the years. I do some public finance as well. It always concerns me when I'm picking a jury with me and my client being the only African-Americans in the courtroom white judges, white prosecutors. And I see some well-groomed, uh, nice, good-looking Christian or uh, whichever faith they are that come in. And I'm like, well, I may have a chance to get me another African-American on this jury. And when I hear that, you know, well, I can't sit in the judge of anybody. So I know we're talking about voting now, but I think that this is a conversation of uh, voting and serving on jurors and different things. I think that's a conversation that's ripe for discussion and that we should, uh, that we could have a whole nother forum just on that issue alone. Yeah, so I, I just want to throw that out there. I'm glad to hear you all's perspective on it. And certainly I think there's a lot of people in your audience that's listening now and in our society who would like to uh, uh, hear more of your position on these types. I'd like to just just throw this up on my screen. It's kind of a little awkward because it's over my face. But um, for, for some of you that that, that yeah, we're, uh, here, let me just not put it over my face. Let's put it over there. When we talk about um, the Adventist Church, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and the posture that historically um, this denomination has taken uh, towards voting, you're going to read a lot of stuff. And there there are just like in any organization, there are wide and varied responses to this. But this was written in the the official uh or, or magazine or, or periodical of the church back in the year 1882 and it says this were we living under an absolute monarchy all we could do would be to pray but in this republic we have an instrument given with which we can second our prayers this is what jd was talking about and that is our ballot 
Um, the Seventh Day Adventist Church has has a a history, a rich history, of getting involved in the process processes that engage justice, that engage mercy, that engage righteousness. Um, and, and yeah, we don't want to get into a lot of the fluff and a lot of the mess, but when it pertains to issues of justice, when it pertains to issues of mercy, um, that the Seventh-day Adventist church is a church that historically we have not been a people who have been willing just to sit and let things happen in spite of the fact that we believe that Jesus is coming again, that we believe that things on earth will get worse along the way. But there has been no, uh, there has been, we have never believed that we are just to sit idly by and watch mm -hmm. it happen. And so we want to encourage our folk out there, do what we have done today. Get into the, uh, some of you have already voted, but some of you voted and didn't know what you were voting about. We're not saying just go down there and mark every ticket that's just because it's a Democrat or just because it's a Republican or whatever. Get in, find the information that you need to, to educate yourself so that you are voting intelligently. If you don't know, get out and ask somebody. Hop on some of these websites, Ballotopia, uh, find out uh, what are some of the resources that you can find because in addition to these statewide initiatives every single one of you have a different set of countywide initiatives and individuals who are running for local office you need to have you need to pay attention if you're sending your child to public school you need to know who's running who's on that school board um, you need to know what's going on in your local community so find out what's going on do some research don't be an ignorant voter don't be just somebody who sits on the sidelines ignorantly not knowing what's going on and 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 just do that thing of doing what Jesus would do. Savior, the Bible says that the Savior mingled among men who does uh, as one who desired their good. He ministered to their needs. Your vote might be ministering to somebody's needs. Uh, and then he bade them follow me. You can't do the follow me part without being engaged in the other two. We want to just thank uh, uh, a very special thank you to each of our panelists today from, from uh, Mr. Smart, uh, from uh, Representative Brise, from Senator Thurston to, uh, how do we say that, Esquire Brown, um, from uh, Sister Esquire Dennis, who was with us earlier, uh, my co-host, uh, Pastor Batten, I'm going to, and, and, and JD, Pastor um, James Doggett, um, Pastor Doggett pastors in Deerfield Beach. Um, he's in the, our southern or northern tip of Broward County. Um, Pastor Batten pastors the Mount Olivet Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I have the wonderful privilege of pastoring the New Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church in the heart of, of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So many of our other pastors uh, who were um, in the wings today, and some of them were just not able to be with us, all scattered throughout Broward County. We thank you all for your support, um, and especially for Senator Thurston, uh, who took the time out of his schedule. He didn't know any of us. Uh, we made a call, talked to Miss Jones uh, a couple weeks back to try to make this happen, and, and he took the time on a Sunday afternoon during football time and all that other kind of stuff to come and spend with us. Senator, thank you so very much. I'm going to let Pastor Batten take us out. Yes, again. We Pastor, Pastor, before, you, yes. before you take us out, I do want you to know, I, I do know uh, some of you. I, I know my good friend, Ron Brise, uh -huh. who I've known for years and who I served with in the Florida House of Representatives when I was first elected back in 2006. So I, I know him very, very well. Yeah, and just before Pastor Batten, we got to say this about, about Representative Rizé. Some of our audience may not know this because I'm seeing in our chat, we've got Adventists who are from all over and, and people who are from all over, not just from Florida. But uh, uh, Representative Rizé is a Seventh-day Adventist who has served in our state legislature. Um, served for, for several, how many terms was it, Ron? That you were sure, so thank you. I served for two terms in the Florida House House, um, Senator Thurston and I we were freshman um, uh, representatives together and then I got appointed to the Florida Public Service Commission and I served two terms there um, so I've had a great opportunity to serve our, our state in a few different capacities. Wow, that, that's awesome. So we thank you both for your service um, to our state, um, to our people. Thank you so much for what you've done. Uh, Pastor B. Yes, uh, again, I want to thank everyone for their time to, today, for being able to take some time to be with us on this uh, very special and important information that we have talked about today. 
educating ourselves on the issues uh, at the ballot. Uh, and so we want to thank everyone. Uh, Pastor uh, Paul, thank you, sir, uh, for uh, initiating uh, this contact today. Uh, uh, Pastor JD, uh, man, we appreciate you and all the other uh, uh, colleagues. We are definitely appreciate everyone uh, for uh, their kindness and their help and, and great job. And for the uh, South Florida uh, Youth Federation, Yes, as yes, well, yes, and, yes. Uh, for, for their support and help. And so i uh, just like to say thank you so much. Uh, go out, and if you haven't voted already, uh, now that you know what you are voting about, go ahead and do that thing. Vote uh, and make your voice heard, and may God bless and keep each of you is my prayer.